considerations around what the footprint is and how much space there is in a particular building, what the services are, kitchens. There's all kinds of requirements around kitchens for ventilation and other things. So, uh, you know, it can depend. Can you just uh, sign this space? Just to just that. If there's enough space yes. there, it could be something that could be considered. But on the other hand, it would, it would have a price tag attached to it. And you have to you know, assess that on a, on a project by project basis. And looking at just making rates a more friendly customer service related operation in, in the winter time, uh, is that something that rig staff could have other duties added on their duties, and how would that be managed under your current? I mean, through, through the chair, uh, I mean, we have a, a fairly limited staff. Uh, Complement when it comes to rig supervision in the winter, uh, and you know, with over 500 sort of recreation locations operating at the same time, including those 52 rinks, uh, quite often there's part-time staff that are that are in the rink uh, and you know have those duties that are there. So you know, it, it certainly it's something that we can look at. We want staff to be as friendly as possible. Obviously, that would be a goal of ours. Uh, and we can have a look at the types of duties that they're doing and whether there's any room for additional uh, you know, responsibilities. Uh, you know, as I, said. I was just at the volunteer group for long-term care, and they operate little tuck shops and um, you know, food. They sell certain types of food there. Is that something that? Community could do there without any trouble if there's community members who would be sure we're open to any you know discussions or uh, initiatives that the community is interested in, uh, and often respond to those on a, on a rank by rank or a location by location basis. But it's sort of we'll have to talk about a for profit operation. That's not something that would be uh, encouraged to move on to the rank that we sell. If Tim Hortons wanted a franchise, correct? Right. Would be probably say no. We wouldn't but be giving up the rank if somebody wanted to stay Saturday afternoons or hot chocolate afternoons, and staff were part of that. That would be. You could look at that. Okay. We we could definitely look at it. I should say that you know the only real concessions we have you know offered through uh, city contract is in a number of the arenas, and that's through uh, you know a formal RFP RFQ uh, you know process that we go through. Uh, what you're talking about is a much you know smaller volunteer based. Kind now of I know that there's some interest in having community members build things and even the rink or renovate things, is that something, I think we you work off of an RFP, it's a tender, it's got to be up to a certain code, we can't just say, well, okay, why don't you guys just renovate that room? Is that, is that your approach? Mr. Mr. Like Mr. Mr. Uh, Mr. Schreiner. Caretaking to animation. Uh, so, 
And, and you're, you're good with that as a concept, right? Just let's start with that. For the chair, we don't have any objections that it's a concept, but you know, as I stated earlier, we do have a limited amount of resources that are available. You know, right. to discuss. And, and how does that, uh, you know, I have one council by law has three rings. I think you know, if there's 51 of them, that's at least 1.2 per per ward. Um, how does that process happen? Is there is there a departmental uh, uh, prioritization that this is where we want to go? Or is it really up to the counselor or the community, or is it really all three? So through the chair, I would, you know, overall and generally, we have a standard level of staffing that we have at all of our outdoor ranks. It would be the same right across the city. Quite often when these kinds of initiatives come forward around activation or animation, uh, um, they're in collaboration with community, with friends up groups, with other community-based organizations who are interested in becoming part of that particular location. And there's a number of examples across the state of when that happens. Okay, I'm good. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Bob. Sorry, just a very quick question. We'll take as much time as you need. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so with regards to these, the, the, the partnerships, I mean, in some uh, places we even have formal arrangements, right? In other words, less formal, is that uh, that's correct? And, and so this would be something that, you know, um, it could be helpful as well if we have um, the relationship defined between the nonprofit and um, our, or the city. It could also help us with our um, uh, labor partners and these issues that may, might arise with um, um, collective agreements and so on, correct? Uh, through the chair, that's correct. I, I, I would say we try and be as nimble as we can. So if there's you know, uh, an easy way to do things, uh, depending on what the group wants to do in the park or in the rink or in the pool, wherever that might be, if it's not contrary to any agreements or any you know, other sort of stipulations, then we can do those things on our own. If it goes past a certain point and it involves you know, labor agreements and other things, then that's when we would pursue some kind of formal agreement. Thank you. I, I don't don't get me wrong. It's a very important issue here. I, I must admit, I'm, I'm running a little late for another uh, obligation, but I was hoping to be here for this discussion. Um, speakers, I have a few questions. Uh, <laughs> Councilor Cole, waiting for my time to be. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Take the full time. It's. Um. Uh, for you, uh, I guess my first question is just for clarity. When, when, and I know that's different settings and circumstances, but when dealing with uh, an outdoor rink, which departmental staff have, uh, have any kind of uh, uh, purview over over a rink? Is it is it all park staff? Through the chair, so all the outdoor rinks um, would be with with the exception of some of the civic centers. So, as an example, Nathan Phillips Square, uh, North Rope Civic Center, and Scarborough Civic Center. Uh, all of the staff groups there within would be within PF and the, the, uh but within different branches within the division. So ice maintenance is done through our parks crews, and the actual supervision, rink attendants, uh, custodial services are done through uh, recreation side. And then when a, a, an outdoor rink is adjacent to a community center or, or another uh, city building with another use, is it still the same? It's still uh, park staff? Depends on, on where and, and how close the location is. So if uh, and there may be some differences around uh, you know geography. So if there's a community center and there's an outdoor rink attached to the community center, if there's an arena, an indoor arena, an outdoor arena, we'll try and use staff as efficiently as we can between the two locations. So we don't have separate crews coming in just to do the ice maintenance. And, and, and my my experience with uh, outdoor rink staff um, seems seems to be solely. Uh, what I described as very nice and kind, but like teenage kids, um, are there other people in and around uh, uh, an outdoor rink that, besides maintenance, that would that would, the public would interact with? Uh, through the ch through the chair, I'm gonna ask, actually ask Kelly to answer that. <clears throat> through the chair, we we do have different levels of, of management with respect to our outdoor rinks. So there are coordinator level staff who have um, oversight and 
maybe perhaps greater experience and, and do have a, a few rings within their cluster that they would do rotating visits. We have full-time community recreation programmers who then oversee the, the full operation within that cluster. And often those staff are attached to a community center location. They need to provide oversight and then we do have our supervisors. So there are a number of, of staff involved in the, in the operation within our four districts. Um, and in terms of uh, setting schedules, and I know you can never make everyone happy because there's always competing interests and the, you know, the, the shiny guys want to be out there when the, the kids, the little kids want to be out there. My experience, and I'm, I'm very biased because I have three people that want to skate there between six and 11 years old, but my, my experience seems to be that the, the time and the schedules don't align with when kids really are out of school. And I'm just my curious. My guess, my question that is: A, how are the schedules set? And secondly, do schedule are schedules set so that neighboring rinks can complement each other in time? So if uh, if one is not available, one that's not too far away could be. And through the chair, I mean that that is the ideal approach for sure. And I think if there's some specific examples of rinks that you're you're finding that we, we can certainly take that offline and, and take a look at that. But again, yeah, programming idea is around not duplicating and overlapping times within a certain geographic catchment, making sure that we're not scheduling things for kids when they're in school. I mean, those would be the principles by which we would program. And, and do you have to date, and I'm, I'm, they seem to change year over year, do you in any formal way ask for input from users to determine whether the scheduling was was well received or, or not? I think we could formalize that better than we do. I think it's probably informal. It's based on feedback that we get from users. Um, we're going to take a look at sort of debriefing this year's season on whether we can do a, 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 some type of user assessment. I think some of this report will be helpful in framing some of the questions we may want to be asking the public. Now, uh, just for my last kind of couple questions, more of uh, related to Capital. You know, Councillor Mahevich's board, they've done a great thing where they've added a change room on the back of an arena for an outdoor rink. And, and my guess is that was largely driven by the local councillor. Um, not the funding source. Can, can you give me other examples where, whether improvements like were suggested in the presentation or one like Councillor Mahevich did in his ward or others where they've been kind of staff driven or if there are any examples like that or do largely they fall to kind of the community and slash the councillor to become the champions? Through you, Madam Chair. Uh, generally, the discussion has come up through the local councillor who really has a good pulse on what the community um, wants from their facility through their discussions, probably with um, stakeholders from that um, local, in this case, outdoor ice rink. Um, and we begin a process of trying to find a solution to, to make it um, a better facility. So I, I, couldn't, I couldn't find, or maybe I could, could I find a staff document that says, that is a bit aspirational, that says, here are the changes we'd like to make to these 14 outdoor rinks with price tags and costs. If the community and the councillor don't want to push for them, fair enough, but here's what we could and or could or would do if we, if we had the money. It's true, the chair, there isn't a document like that that exists. You're, you're correct. I think now that we're doing the uh, Parks and Recreation Facilities Master Plan, uh, what you're referencing is a standard around how we would uh, redevelop outdoor rinks when they're open for that state good repair sort of, uh, you know, initiative and what we want them to be. And I think we're certainly open to developing that kind of standard as part of the planning process. Okay. I notice I'm over my time and uh, you know, well, but Councillor Fletcher is now in the chair, so everything is... <laughs> I should add, I know you're over your time, but uh, you know, there's operating impacts of those as well. So the, the larger and the, and the more robust those facilities become, there are operating impacts that go along with that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, you're very welcome. Anybody else who wants to come around? Thank you. Uh, to speak? I don't even know what I'm like. Oh, yes, there we go. To speak. I have a motion, but go ahead. So do I. It really is just to refer this, uh, refer the report and uh, uh, to a staff for future planning. Uh, they are doing the facilities master plan, and I, I think the conversation was a good one. But what I'm hearing is is that uh, that the, 
uh, sea loss, and frankly, yeah, I think it's echoed in, in uh, my ward. Uh, we did put in a, an additional rink of leveraging an already existing in, indoor rink and saying, okay, if the new compressor is going in, let's make sure it's big enough, and then let's make sure that uh, the Zambona gets uh, full use, although I'm not sure it's, uh, it's the same Zambona. I think you, you drive around, don't you, sometimes? <laughs> You all, you all. Um, anyway, I think there's a lot of leveraging that can be done, and a lot of ideas that can come forward. Uh, I, I think that uh, what this conversation really was about was from moving from a caretaker role of these facilities to a facilitative role of these facilities. The reason why we, we invest that Section 37 money or the debt finance money into these things is so that the community use them and feel we get some life, community life out of the, out of the deal. Uh, and um, um, right now, I think that it, it's it's a little bit short. When when staff are hired, certainly the, the rink that they're hired at in my ward, uh, I feel that uh, yeah, they're they're hanging around and they're watching the place. But it would be nice if they had a more facilitative approach to things and you know got something going. If there was just kids there, or if there was seniors there, or developed a, a, an approach that. Uh, was uh, was uh, more community engaging. So um, uh, conversation was a good one, and let's see what uh, what, what can come out of it through some staff processes. So. Thank you. If there's a motion, anyone else to speak? Councilor Boyd, okay. some of the time you would like to. Yes, Councilor Bailey. Thank you. Um, uh, I, I agree with Councilor Mahavik. I think it was uh, a good conversation. Um, I would I would like to see um, this the, the role of the caretaker into the animator really explored. Um, I think that it's not the only thing, but I think it, it, it is an important one. Um, and, and particularly, the other side is the partnerships. Um, I mean, obviously, um, you know, lots of people around the city talk about deaf and grove, deaf and grove, and I always say, you know, I, I wish I, I, I had the support in Castle to have the Dufferin Grove model across the street, but that would cost millions of dollars and, and unfortunately can't just increase the park's uh, budget by, by, by that much. And so these partnerships um, and being innovative and, and um, getting our uh, parks uh, better used by some of our nonprofit organizations and have that relationship, but clear relationship, clear uh, the vision and, and, and uh, the partnership, I think it's important. I think in Ward 18 we've been very successful uh, in being innovative from our, like I said, the container project to uh, 15 years ago at, uh, at Deaf and Grove, and I think there has been some, um, you know, uh, growing pains uh, in the last few years, uh, but I think that what we've seen is that uh, the services uh, are there. There were things that we needed to deal with that we were uh, um, in contravention of our um, uh, uh, local agreement. Yes, <laughs> the the labor's agreements and so on, and we had to take care of all that. Uh, but I think that. Uh, the programs are there, they're expanding into other parks, and now we're having this conversation today on how important it is to bring those activities. It is about the experience that we, we give people, and for that, it's about the experience that staff, the customer service that service provide, and, and being an animator, and then how we can enhance that experience through the skate landing, through music, through, uh, maybe crafts, maybe food, maybe there's so much that, that can be done and then it really depends from community to community. But I think that uh, that it's uh, worthwhile to uh, to explore some of these um, uh, these concepts and I'm looking forward to uh, see the report from, uh, from staff. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you so much, Dr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So much, Thank you. Gracious. Um, uh, I think this is a good, to reiterate uh, another discussion, one that we should have. And I, I as, a, as a, a, an active uh, rink user, I use the indoor ones more than uh, the outdoor ones. But uh, I'm a, I think I was at on the uh, I was at rinks outdoor indoor about 350 times this year. So I have a pretty good amount of a pretty good insight into it. Um, I, I think just 
what this uh, report, which is welcome outlines, and I think some of the discussion is that they just could be so much more. Uh, I think we're providing excellent service and are well used and embraced and loved, and, and you know we have to get better on, on kind of some of the some of the issues around scheduling and things like that. I just think they could be so much more, and it's um, it's a, an asset we have in our city that we're not uh, fully using or leveraging, and I think that. Um, and it's important to uh, to continue this conversation so that we do we do take advantage of, of these assets that we spend a lot of money on. And so let's let's use them to the fullest. Um, I know that uh, I, I pester um, park staff regularly on some of my pet peeves around uh, rinks and arenas, and you, and you may be hearing more about that from Councillor Burnside and, and I in the coming months. But um, I, I think this is a good start to this conversation, and I look forward. Uh, to the report so that these can become the animated centers that uh, we'd like them to be. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, I have a motion. You can put it up on the screen. Report to September 20th uh, on, the, uh, on the 2015 green season, including the current management model, kind of getting at the issue of parks and recreation relationships, levels of expertise required by staff, protocols and standards related to ice quality, maintenance, safety, rates of usage, and recommendations for any improvement in departmental customer service for all artificial ice rinks for 2016-17, and to analyze the potential of establishing rink classifications, including a possible destination rink, a designation such as Nathan Phillips Square is a destination rink, so is there something else that should happen there? Do we have others, Sir Sam? Uh, Smith, probably Dufferin Grove would be a destination rink. There's, there's rinks where we can begin to do certain things. So I think that is, uh, I've also put in here, besides the community animation piece, certain things that, that just the ice quality through the year. You know, it's a very short skating season. I believe that we have to have the highest level of interaction, ice quality, and just management, overall management possible. And I agree in trying to add those interesting parts in uh, that we're discussing earlier as far as animation. I do believe that in, in the outdoor rinks that where there is community interest, it's easier to build those kinds of programs in because you've already got people active around the rinks. Sometimes there's rinks that don't actually have a lot of people skating on them from those neighborhoods. One of the th exciting things that um, well, I have a lot of outdoor rinks, and I'm going to tell you why. It's because the old city of Toronto boundaries, uh, I've got the rinks that were associated with the old city of Toronto boundaries. So the old city used to go to East York, so Withrow Rink covered that area. Riverdale Rink was part of Riverdale Park. That was one big park in Metro days. Monarch Park is at the Coxwell. And actually, it's part of was part of the old board nine. It's got four wards around it, but there was not four wards when it was built. There was one ward. So it looks like they have a lot of rinks. They just happen to be geographically located in this new ward that was when all the other wards were carved up. So for that reason, I probably know far too much about rinks and the fact that I like to skate. So just going back to uh, some of the things with. Uh, when we do build a new rink, or do try to make sure that our current rinks are upgraded to the point where they're very heavily used, people are coming. One of the things I think is important, wherever we can put in a skate trail, we should put that in. We're talking about Shinny, and you just talked about Shinny. That is hockey, then there's the permit times for hockey, and there's no time, you'll have to be very careful with your schedule. Can I get over there for my hour of free skating? When you have a skate trail, it is pleasure skating all the time. You can't believe what it looks like to see all those little kids out with their parents learning to skate with their little push carts. So I think that's something that the department has realized, and wherever possible, is trying to build that in. Why would we redo a rink and not make it the best possible new standard in today's in today's world. I've said it many times, Torontonians love to skate. I look out the window at Nathan Phillips, my office covers Nathan Phillips, I couldn't skate, there's no room to skate there, there's so many people out skating. Classes are coming, there's not enough pleasure skating, we need to take the current rinks and add trails wherever we can. I am, uh, want to clarify something on the record, and that is the characterization of 
the redevelopment of Greenwood Rink somehow leaving the community out of that process. They were very involved in the process and design, uh, so much so that after they saw that film, they made their own film that said, we are involved, this is what we have done, we love this rink, and quite frankly, it's one of the busiest rinks in the city. So I don't mind having a few. We can have crafts there, if we can have food there, if we can have hot chocolate there, but I really do think that my community put tremendous effort in, and if somebody didn't get the idea they want, you can't say that there wasn't a process. So let me just be clear about that. It was a very good process, and it was very local. All the people around that link I'm glad that they went and built their outdoor rink. That's fantastic. We love outdoor, natural outdoor rinks. But there's not just one kind of rink. Natural outdoor is great. This is a fantastic rink. So let's have as many rinks as we can for our skating season and hope that next year it's going to be colder than this last winter. Really? Yes. <laughs> all right. So two motions up. Do you want to take them as a package? All right. All in favor? Oh, that's fine, thank you very much. And now I motion to adjourn. I want to be very formal. Motion to adjourn. Councillor